Chapter 25. Trail of Oil. What was I thinking? wondered Aragon in the morning. His head was pounding and his tongue felt thick and fuzzy. As a rat skittered under the floor, Aragon winced at the noise. How are we feeling? asked Sephira smugly. Aragon ignored her. A moment later, Brom rolled out of bed with a grumble. He doused his head in cold water from the basin, then left the room. Aragon followed him into the hallway. Where are you going? he asked. To recover. I'll come. At the bar, Aragon discovered that Brahm's method of recovery involved imbibing copious amounts of hot tea and ice water and washing it all down with brandy. When they returned to the room, Aragon was able to function somewhat better. Brahm belted on his sword and smoothed the wrinkles out of his robe. The first thing we need to do is ask some discreet questions. I want to find out where the sether oil was delivered in Drasleona and where it was taken from there. Most likely, soldiers or workmen were involved in transporting it. We have to find those men and get one to talk. They left the Golden Globe and searched for warehouses where the sether oil might have been delivered. Near the center of Drasleona, the streets began to slant upward toward a palace of polished granite. It was built on a rise so that it towered above every building except the cathedral. The courtyard was a mosaic of mother-of-pearl, and parts of the walls were inlaid with gold. Black statues stood in alcoves, alcoves, with sticks of incense smoking in their cold hands. Soldiers stationed every four yards watched passerbys keenly. "'Who lives there?' asked Aragon in awe. "'Marcus Tabor, ruler of the city. He answers only to the king in his own conscience, which hasn't been very active recently,' said Brom. They walked around the palace, looking at the gated, ornate houses that surrounded it. By midday, they had learned nothing useful, so they stopped for lunch. "'This city is too vast for us to comb it together,' said Brom. "'Search on your own. Meet me at the Golden Globe by dusk.' He glowered at Aragon from under his bushy eyebrows. "'I'm trusting you not to do anything stupid.' "'I won't,' promised Aragon. Brom handed him some coins, then strode away in the opposite direction." Throughout the rest of the day, Aragon talked with shopkeepers and workers, trying to be as pleasant and charming as he could. His questions led him from one end of the city to the other and back again. No one seemed to know about the oil. Wherever he went, the cathedral stared down at him. It was impossible to escape its tall spires. At last he found a man who, helped, who had helped ship the sether oil and remembered to which warehouse it had been taken. Aragon excitedly went to look at the building, then returned to the Golden Globe. It was over an hour before Brom came back, slumped with fatigue. "'Did you find anything?' asked Aragon. Brom brushed back his white hair. "'I heard a great deal of interesting things today, not the least of which is that Galbatorix will visit Drasleona within the week.' "'What?' exclaimed Aragon. Brom slouched against the wall, the lines on his forehead deepening. It seems that Tabor has taken a few too many liberties with his power, so Galbatorix has decided to come teach him a lesson in humility. It's the first time the king has left Urubain in over ten years. Do you think he knows of us? asked Aragon. Of course he knows of us, but I'm sure he hasn't been told our location. If he had, we would already be in the Razak's grasp. However, this means whatever we're going to do about the Razak must be accomplished before Galbatorix arrives. We don't want to be anywhere within twenty leagues of him. The one thing in our favor is that the Razak are sure to be here, preparing for his visit. I want to get the Razak, said Aragon, his fist tightening, but not if it means fighting the king. He could probably tear me to pieces. That seemed to amuse Brom. Very good. Caution. And you're right. You wouldn't stand a chance against Galbatorix. Now tell me what you learned today. It might confirm what I heard. Aragon shrugged. It was mostly drivel, but I did talk with a man who knew where the oil was taken. It's just an old warehouse. Other than that, I didn't discover anything useful. My day was a little more fruitful than yours. I heard the same thing you did, so I went to the warehouse and talked with the workers. It didn't take much cajoling before they revealed that the cases of sether oil are always sent from the warehouse to the palace. And that's when you came back here, finished Aragon. No, it's not. Don't interrupt. After that, I went to the palace and got myself invited in, into the servants' quarters as a bard. For several hours I wandered about, amusing the maids and others with songs and poems, and asking questions all the while. Brom slowly refilled his pipe with tobacco. It's really amazing all the things servants find out. Did you know that one of the earls has three mistresses, 
and they all live in the same wing of the palace? He shook his head and lit the pipe. Aside from the fascinating tidbits, I was told quite by accident where the oil is taken from the palace. And that is? asked Aragon impatiently. Brom puffed on his pipe and blew a smoke ring. Out of the city, of course. Every full moon, two slaves are sent to the base of Helgrind with a month's worth of provisions. Whenever the Sether oil arrives and drowns Leona, they send it along with the provisions. The slaves are never seen again. And the one time someone followed them, he disappeared too. I thought the riders demolished the slave trade, said Aragon. Unfortunately, it has flourished under the king's reign. So the Razak are in Helgrind, said Aragon, thinking of the rock mountain. They are or somewhere nearby. If they are in Helgrind, they'll either be at the bottom, protected by a thick stone door, or higher up where only their flying mounts, or Sephira, can reach. Top or bottom, their shelter will no, bout, no doubt be disguised. He thought for a moment. If Sephira and I go flying around Helgrind, the Razak are sure to see us, not to mention all of Dresleona. It is a problem, agreed Brom. Aragon frowned. What if we took the place of the two slaves? The full moon isn't far off. It would give us the perfect opportunity to get close to the Razak. Brom tugged his beard thoughtfully. That's chancy at best. If the slaves are killed from a distance, we'll be in trouble. We can't harm the Razak if they aren't in sight. We don't know if the slaves are killed at all, Aragon pointed out. I'm sure they are, said Brom, his face grave. Then his eyes sparkled, and he blew another smoke ring. Still, it's an intriguing idea. If it were done with Sephira hidden nearby and, uh... His voice trailed off. It might work, but we'll have to move quickly. With the king coming, there isn't much time. Should we go to Helgrind and look around? It would be good to see the land in daylight so we won't be surprised by any ambushes, said Aragon. Brom fingered his staff. That can be done later. Tomorrow we'll return to the palace and figure out how we can replace the slaves. I'll have to be careful not to arouse suspicion, though. I could easily be revealed by spies and courtiers who know about the Razak. I can't believe it. We actually found them, said Aragon quietly. An image of his dead uncle in burned farm flashed through his mind. His jaw tightened. The toughest part is yet to come, but yes, we've done well, said Brom. If fortune fuss smiles on us, you may soon have your revenge, and the Varden will be rid of a dangerous enemy. What comes after that will be up to you. Aragon opened his mind and jubilantly told Sephira, We found the Razak's lair. Where? He quickly explained what they had discovered. Hellgrind, she mused. A fitting place for them. Aragon agreed. When we're done here, maybe we could visit Carvajal. Is that what you want? She asked, suddenly sour. To go back to your previous life? You know that won't happen, so stop mooning after it. At a certain point, you have to decide what to commit to. Will you hide for the rest of your life, or will you help the Varden? Those are the only options left to you, unless you join forces with Galvatorix which I do not and will never accept. Softly, he said, If I must choose, I cast my fate with the Varden, as you well know. Yes, but sometimes you have to hear yourself say it. She left him to ponder her words. Aragon was alone in the room when he woke. Scrawled onto the wall with a charcoal stick was a note that read, Aragon, I will be gone until late tonight. Coins for food are under the mattress. Explore the city, enjoy yourself, but stay unnoticed. Brom. P.S. Avoid the palace. Don't go anywhere without your bow. Keep it strong. Aragon wiped the wall clean, then retrieved the money from under the bed. He slipped the bow across his back, thinking, I wish I didn't have to go armed all the time. He left the Golden Globe and ambled through the streets, stopping to observe whatever interested him. There were many intriguing stores, but none quite as exciting as Angela's herb shop in term. At times he glared at the dark, claustrophobic houses and wished that he were free of the city. When he grew hungry, he bought a wedge, wedge of cheese and a loaf of bread and ate them, sitting on a curb. Later, in a far corner of Dresleona, he heard an auctioneer rattling off a list of prices. Curious, he headed toward the voice and arrived at a wide opening between two buildings. Ten men stood on a waist-high platform. Arrayed before them was a richly dressed crowd that was both colorful and boisterous. Where are the goods for sale? wondered Aragon. The auctioneer finished his list and motioned for a young man to behind the platform to join him. The man awkwardly climbed up, chains dragging at his hands and feet. And here we have our first item, 
proclaimed the auctioneer. A healthy female from the Hatterack Desert, captured just last month, and in excellent condition. Look at those arms and legs. He's as strong as a bull. He'd be perfect as a shield bearer. Or, if you don't trust him for that, hard labor. But let me tell you, lords and ladies, that would be a waste. He's bright as a nail, if you can get him to talk a civilized tongue. The crowd laughed, and Aragon ground his teeth with fury. His lips started to form a word that would free the slave, and his arm, newly liberated from the splint, rose. The mark on his palm shimmered. He was about to release the magic when it struck him. He'd never get away. The slave would be caught before he reached the city walls. Aragon would only make the situation worse if he tried to help. He lowered his arm and quietly cursed. Think, this is how you got into trouble with the Urgles. He watched helplessly as the slave was sold to a tall, hawk-nosed man. The next slave was a tiny girl, no more than six years old, wrenched from the arms of her crying mother. As the auctioneer started the bidding, Aragon forced himself to walk away, rigid with fury and outrage. It was several blocks before the weeping, weeping was inaudible. I'd like to see a thief try to cut my purse right now, he thought grimly, almost wishing it would happen. Frustrated, he punched a nearby wall, bruising his knuckles. That's the sort of thing I could stop by fighting the Empire, he realized. With Saphira by my side, I could free those slaves. I've been graced with special powers. It would be selfish of me not to use them for the benefit of others. If I don't, I might as well not be a writer at all. It was a while before he took stock of his bearings and was surprised to find himself before the cathedral. Its twisted spires were covered with statues and scroll work. Snarling gargoyles were crouched along the eaves. Fantastic beasts writhed on the walls, and heroes and kings marched along their bottom edges, frozen in cold marble. Ribbed arches and tall stained-glass windows lined the cathedral's sides, along with columns of differing sizes. A lonely turret hemmed the building like a mast. Recessed in shadow at the cathedral's front was an iron-bound door inlaid with a row of silver script that Aragon recognized as the ancient language. As best he could tell, it read, May thee who enter here understand thine impermanence and forget thine attachments to that which is beloved. The entire building sent a shiver down Aragon's spine. There was something menacing about it, as if it were a predator crouched in the city, waiting for its next victim. A broad row of steps led to the cathedral's entrance. Aragon solemnly ascended them and stopped before the door. I wonder if I can go in. Almost guiltily, he pushed on the door. It swung open smoothly, gild gliding on oiled hinges. He stepped inside. The silence of a forgotten tomb filled the empty cathedral. The air was chill and dry. Bare walls extended to a vaulted ceiling that was so high Aragon felt no taller than an ant. Stained glass windows depicting scenes of anger, hate, and remorse pierced the walls, while spectral beams of light washed sections of the granite pews with transparent hues, leaving the rest in shadow. His hands were shaded a deep blue. Between the windows stood statues with rigid, pale eyes. He returned their stern gazes, then slowly trod up the center row, afraid to break the quiet. His leather boots padded noiselessly on the polished stone floor. The altar was a great slab of stone, devoid of adornment. A solitary finger of light fell upon it, Illuminated, illuminating motes of golden dust floating in the air. Behind the altar, the pipes of a wind organ pierced the ceiling and opened themselves to the elements. The instrument would play its music only when a gale rocked Drasleona. Out of respect, Aragon knelt before the altar and bowed his head. He did not pray, but paid homage to the cathedral itself. The sorrows of the lives it had witnessed, as well as the unpleasantness of the elaborate pageantry that played out between its walls, emanated from the stones. It was a forbidding place, bare and cold. In that chilling touch, though, came a glimpse of eternity and perhaps the powers that lay there. Finally, Aragon inclined his head and rose. Calm and grave, he whispered words to himself in the ancient language, then turned to re leave. He froze. His heart jumped, hammering like a drum. The Razak stood at the cathedral's entrance, watching him. Their swords were drawn, keen edges bloody in a crimson light. A sibilant hiss came from the smaller Razak. Neither of them moved. 
Rage welled up in Aragon. He had chased the Razak for so many weeks that the pain of their murderous deed had doled within him. But his vengeance was at hand. His wrath exploded like a volcano, fueled even more by his pent-up fury at the slave's plight. A roar broke from his lips, echoing like a thunderstorm as he snatched his bow from his back. Deftly, he fitted an arrow to the string and loosed it. Two more followed an instant later. The Razak left, leapt away from the arrows with inhuman swiftness. They hissed as they ran up the aisle between the pews, cloaks flapping like raven wings. Aragon reached for another arrow, but caution stayed his hand. If they knew where to find me, Brahm is in danger as well. I must warm, warn him. Then, to Aragon's horror, a line of soldiers filed into the cathedral, and he glimpsed a field of uniforms jostling outside the doorway. Aragon gazed hungrily at the charging Razak, then swept around, searching for a means of escape. A vestibule to the left of the altar caught his attention. He bounded through the archway and dashed down a corridor that led to a priory with a belfry. The patter of the Razak's feet behind him made him quicken his pace until the hallway abruptly ended with a closed door. He pounded against it, trying to break it open, but the wood was too strong. The Razak were nearly upon him. Frantic, he sucked in his breath and barked, Jirda! With a flash, the door splintered into pieces and fell to the floor. Aragon jumped into the small room and continued running. He sped through several chambers, startling a group of priests. Shouts and curses followed him. The priory bell toiled in alarm. Aragon dodged through the kitchen, passed a pair of monks, then slipped through a side door. He skidded to a stop in a garden surrounded by a high brick wall, devoid of handholds. There were no other exits. Aragon turned to leave, but there was a low hiss as the Razak shouldered aside the door. Desperate, he rushed at the wall, arms pumping. Magic could not help him here. If he used it to break through the wall, he would be too tired to run. He jumped. Even with his arms outstretched, only his fingertips cleared the edge of the wall. The rest of his body smashed against the bricks, driving out his breath. Aragon gasped and hung there, struggling not to fall. The Razak prowled into the garden, swinging their heads from side to side like wolfhounds sniffing for prey. Aragon sensed their approach and heaved with his arms. His sh shoulders shrieked with pain as he scrambled onto the wall and dropped to the other side. He stumbled, then regained his balance and darted down an alley just as the Razak leapt over the wall. Galvanized, Aragon put on another burst of speed. He ran for over a mile before he had to stop and catch his breath. Unsure if he had lost the Razak, he found a crowded marketplace and dived under a parked wagon. How did they find me? he wondered, panting. They shouldn't have known where I was. Unless something happened to Brom. He reached out with his mind to Safira and said, The Razak found me. We're all in danger. Check if Brom's all right. If he is, warn him and have him meet me at the inn, and be ready to fly here as fast as you can. We may need your help to escape. She was silent, then said curtly, He'll meet you at the inn. Don't stop moving. You're in great danger. Don't I know it, muttered Aragon, as he rolled out from under the wagon. He hurried back to the Golden Globe, quickly packed their belongings, and saddled the horses and led them into the street. Brom soon arrived, staff in hand, scowling dangerously. He swung onto Snowfire and asked, What happened? I was in the cathedral when the Razak just appeared behind me, said Aragon, climbing onto Kadok. I ran back as fast as possible but they could be here at any second. Safira will join us once we're out of Drasleona. We have to get outside the city walls before they close the gates, if they haven't already, said Brom. If they're shut, it'll be nigh impossible for us to leave. Whatever you do, don't get separated from me. Aragon stiffened as ranks of soldiers marched down one end of the street. Brom cursed, last, lashed snowfire with his reins, and galloped away. Aragon bent low over Kadak and followed. They nearly crashed several times during the wild, hazardous ride, plunging through masses of people that clogged the streets as they neared the city wall. When the gates finally came into view, Aragon pulled on Kadok's reins with dismay. The gates were half-closed already, and a double line of pikemen blocked their way. "'They'll cut us to pieces!' he exclaimed. "'We have to try and make it,' said Brom, his voice hard. "'I'll deal with the men, but you have to keep the gates open for us.' Aragon nodded, gritted his teeth, and dug his heels into Kadok. They plowed toward the line of unwavering soldiers, who lowered their pikes toward the horses' chests and braced the weapons against the ground. 
Though the horses snorted with fear, Aragon and Brom held them in place. Aragon heard the soldiers shout, but kept his attention on the gates inching shut. As they neared the sharp pikes, Brom raised his hand and spoke. The words were struck with the words struck with precision. The soldiers fell to each side as if their legs had been cut out from under them. The gap between the gates shrank by the second. Hoping the effort would not prove too much to him, Aragon drew on his power and shouted, Do grind Hildir! A deep grating sound emanated from the gates as they trembled, then ground to a stop. The crowd and guards fell silent, staring with amazement. With a clatter of the horse's hooves, Brahm and Aragon shot out from behind Drasleona's wall. The instant they were free, Aragon released the gates. They shuddered, then boomed shut. He swayed with the expected fatigue, but managed to keep riding. Brahm watched him with concern. Their flight continued through the outskirts of Drasleona as alarm trumpets sounded on the city wall. Sephira was waiting for them by the edge of the city, hidden behind some trees. Her eyes burned, her tail whipped back and forth. Go, ride her, said Brom, and this time stay in the air, no matter what happens to me. I'll head south. Fly nearby, I don't care if Sephira's seen. Aragon quickly mounted Sephira. As the ground dwindled away between, beneath him, he watched Brom gallop along the road. Are you all right? asked Sephira. Yes, said Aragon, but only because we are very lucky. A puff of smoke blew from her nostrils. All the time we've spent searching for the Razak was useless. I know, he said, letting his head sag against her scales. If the Razak had been the only enemies back there, I would have stayed and fought. But with all the soldiers on their side, it was hardly a fair match. You understand there will be talk of us now. This was hardly an unobtrusive escape. Evading the Empire will be harder than ever. There was an edge to her voice that he was unaccustomed to. I know. They flew low and fast over the road. Leona Lake receded behind them. The land became dry and rocky and filled with tough, sharp bushes and tall cactuses. Clouds darkened the sky. Lightning flashed in the distance. As the wind began to howl, Sephira glided steeply down to Brom. He stopped the horses and asked, What's wrong? The wind's too strong. It's not that bad, objected Brom. It is up there, said Aragon, pointing at the sky. Brom swore and handed him Kadok's reins. They trotted away with Sephira following on foot, though on the ground she had difficulty keeping up with the horses. The gale grew stronger, flinging dirt through the air and twirling like a dervish. They wrapped scarves around their heads to protect their eyes. Brom's robe flapped in the wind while his beard whipped about as if it had a life of its own. Though it would make them miserable, Aragon hoped it would rain so their tracks would be obliter obliterated. Soon darkness forced them to stop. With only the stars to guide them, they left the road and made camp behind two boulders. It was too dangerous to light a fire, so they ate cold food while Sephira sheltered them from the wind. After the sparse dinner, Aragon asked bluntly, How did they find us? Brom started to light his pipe, but thought better of it and put it away. One of the palace servants warned me there were spies among them. Somehow word of me and my questions must have reached a boar, and through him, the Razak. We can't go back to Drasleona, can we? asked Aragon. Brom shook his head. Not for a few years. Aragon held his hand, head between his hands. Then should we draw the Razak out? If we let Sephira be seen, they'll come running to wherever she is. And when they do, there will be fifty soldiers with them, said Brom. At any rate... This isn't the time to discuss it. Right now we have to concentrate on staying alive. Tonight will be the most dangerous, because the Razak will be hunting us in the dark, when they are strongest. We'll have to trade watches until morning. Right, said Aragon, standing. He hesitated and squinted. His eyes had caught a flicker of movement, a small patch of color that stood out from the surrounding nightscape. He stepped towards the edge of their camp, trying to see it better. What is it? asked Brahm as he unrolled his blankets. Aragon stared into the darkness, then turned back. I don't know. I thought I saw something. It must have been a bird. Pain erupted in the back of his head, and Sephira roared. Then Aragon toppled to the ground, unconscious. A dull throbbing roused Aragon. Every time blood pulsed through his head, it brought a fresh wave of pain. He cracked his eyes open and winced. Tears rushed to his eyes as he looked directly into a bright lantern. He blinked and looked away. When he tried to sit up, he realized that his hands were tied behind his back. He turned lethargically and saw Brahm's arms. 
Aragon was relieved to see that they were bound together. Why was that? He struggled to figure it out until a thought suddenly came to him. They wouldn't tie up a dead man. But who were they? He swiveled his head further, then stopped as a pair of black boots entered his vision. Aragon looked up, right into the cowled face of a razak. Fear jolted through him. He reached through for the magic and tr started to voice a word that would kill the razak, but then halted, puzzled. He could not remember the word. Frustrated, he tried again, only to feel it slip out of his grasp. Above him, the razak laughed chillingly. The drug is working, yes. I think you will not be bothering us again. There was a rattle off to the left, and Aragon was appalled to see the second razak fit a muzzle over Saphira's head. Her wings were pinioned to her side by black chains. There were shackles on her legs. Aragon tried to contact her, but felt nothing. She was most cooperative once we threatened to kill you, hissed the razak. Squatting by the lantern, he rummaged through Aragon's bags, examining and discarding various items until he removed his rock. What a pretty thing for one so insignificant. Maybe I will keep it. He leaned closer and sneered. Or maybe, if you behave, our master will let you polish it. His moist breath smelled like raw meat. Then he turned the sword over in his hands and screeched as he saw the symbol on the scabbard. His companion rushed over. They stood over the sword, hissing and clicking. At last, they faced Aragon. You will serve our master very well, yes. Aragon forced his thick tongue to form words. If I do, I will kill you. They chuckled coldly. Oh no, we are too valuable. But you, you are disposable. A deep snarl came from Saphira. Smoke roiled from her nostrils. The Razak did not seem to care. Their attention was diverted when Brahm groaned and rolled onto his side. One of the Razak grabbed his shirt and thrust him effortlessly in the air. It's wearing off. Give him more. Let's just kill him, said the shorter Razak. He has caused us much grief. The taller one ran his finger down the sword. A good plan. But remember, the king's instructions were to keep them alive. We can say he was killed when we captured them. And what of this one? Asked the Razak, pointing his sword at Aragon. If he talks... His companion laughed and drew a wicked dagger. He would not dare. There was a long silence and then... Agreed. They dragged Brom to the center of the camp and shoved him to his knees. Brom sagged to one side. Aragon watched with growing fear. I have to get free. He wrenched at the ropes, but they were too strong to break. None of that now, said the tall Razak, poking him with the sword. He nosed the air and sniff. Something seemed to trouble him. The other Razak growled, yanked Brom's head back, and swept the dagger toward his exposed throat. At the very moment, a low buzz sounded, followed by the Razak's howl. An arrow protruded from his shoulder. The Razak nearest Aragon dropped to the ground, barely avoiding a second arrow. He scuttled to his wounded companion, and they glared into the darkness, hissing angrily. They made no move to stop Brom as he blearily struggled, uh, staggered upright. Get down! cried Aragon. Brom wavered, then tottered toward Aragon. As more arrows hissed into the camp from the unseen attackers, the Razak rolled behind some boulders. There was a lull, then the arrows came from the opposite direction. Caught by surprise, the Razak reacted slowly. Their cloaks were pierced in several places, and a shattered arrow buried itself in one's arm. With a wild cry, the smaller Razak fled toward the road, kicking Aragon viciously in the side as he passed. His companion hesitated, then grabbed the dagger from the ground and raced after him. As he left the camp, he hurled the knife at Aragon. A strange light suddenly burned in Brahm's eyes. He threw himself in front of Aragon, his mouth open in a soundless snarl. The dagger struck him with a soft thump, and he landed heavily on his shoulder. His head lolled limply. No! screamed Aragon, though he was doubled over in pain. He heard footsteps, then his eyes closed, and he knew no more.